Chairing today's second session is IPS Senior Research Fellow and Lead Researcher on the Channel News Asia IPS Survey of Race Relations, Dr. Matthew Matthews. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Considerations of race have become central to this year's reserve election for the president. And as can be expected, there's been substantial ground discussion on the matters from several angles. Uh, one angle uh, is the issue of Malay identity. What makes someone Malay? Now, just now, Minister already had mentioned that this was established uh, as early as the GRC system, so it's 1998, where some of this consideration was made. But then, things have changed and time has passed and there are new considerations about identity. And so, one has to continue asking that question, how fixed is this identity? Uh, does it have very definite markers related to ancestry or has the Malay community as a whole embraced a more fluid notion of what constitutes Malayness? If that is so, can the Malay community hold up someone as one of their own, even if he or she may not be 100% Malay as far as ancestry is concerned? Discussions of Malayness, of course, should not just be settled by the Malay community. Uh, other Singaporean communities, the Chinese community, the Indian community, also have their views on this matter, and that need to be reckoned with. Finally, of course, we have the question about the reserve election itself. In terms of whether the issues, are based on the fact that there is a race criteria, whether this might impact on our constitution as a whole, especially on the management of race in Singapore. So we've got three panelists today whose backgrounds allow them to provide expert views on this topic. First, we've got Dr. Noor Sharil Sa'ad, who's a fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, uh, Yusuf Ishak Institute, uh, who has done research and published on issues ranging from contemporary Islamic thought to late President Yusuf Ishak, and has also edited Majla, which is the publication of the Malay Muslim community in Singapore. He's got a good idea about the Malay community and their voices. Then we also have Mr. Gosen Teg, who is the editor of the Singapore Press Holding flagship Mandarin newspaper, Lan Chao Chao Pao, and who will be very aware of what his readers, the broader Chinese community, are thinking when it comes to the reserve elections. He also serves on numerous national communities. Uh, Professor Kevin Tan is an adjunct professor of law at NUS Law School and specializes in constitutional law. Uh, he has also written extensively about the elected presidency and published it as early as 1997. I've told the speakers that they have really have uh, to keep their presentation short uh, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so please don't expect them to cover all the material pertinent to this topic that they've been assigned. So let me just ask all the three speakers to join me on the panel and we just all welcome them. And as they come up, uh, we'll have Dr. Noor Sharil speak for us. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matthew Matthews. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First and foremost, uh, thank you IPS for inviting me to speak at this forum. Um, certainly this is a huge undertaking on my part to speak on an issue that has polarised Singaporeans. I've been asked to speak on debates surrounding the Malay identity that have been thrown up uh, by the system of reserved elections and the range of views uh, within the Malay community. I do not claim to speak on behalf of the community, though I'm a Malay and I closely identify myself with the community, but in this talk, I'm going to make two claims. First, the Malays are divided on these reserve elections. Second, the community's concerns mirror that of all Singaporeans. Let me first speak on the Malay identity issue. The questions, are you Malay or are you Malay enough, have been politicized from time to time in Singapore and more often in neighboring Malaysia. In the 1940s, one prominent Malay nationalist concerned with these issues was none other than Mr. Yusuf Ishak, our first president. Similar discussions on the Malay identity emerged in the 1970s across the causeway when the new economic policy was first introduced. Being Malay then was advantageous because of the special privileges for Bumiputras. Until today, the debate on Melayu Jati or pure Malay 
remains unsettled. Generally, online discussions on Malay identity can be divided into three broad issues. One is the role of ancestry. Two, the position of Islam, language, and culture. And three, candidates' presence within the community. Let me briefly touch on these issues. All three candidates' ancestry have been closely scrutinized by netizens. This is what we call primordialism in sociology, where birth determines a person's ethnic identity. If you follow Malaysian politics very closely, the recent tussle between Mahathir and Zaid Hamidi concerns this issue uh, reflects on primordialism. Now, Ahmad Zaid Hamidi, the Deputy Prime Minister, said Mahathir is not a pure Malay because he has Indian ancestry. And of course, Mahadi refuted this. Primordialism is also evident in the run-up to this reserve elections. Are Madam Halima Yaakob, Mr. Saleh Marikan, or Mr. Farid Khan pure Malays? Madam Halima's father is an Indian, and her mother a Malay. Netizens compare Halima's ancestry with the likes of Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan's and Indrani Raja's ancestry. Both have mixed blood, Indian father, Chinese mother, and they are classified as Indians. Why is Halima different then? For Farid Khan, netizens dispute his Pakistani origins. Now, if you follow ancestry strictly, then no candidate would qualify as a Malay. In Singapore, inter-ethnic marriages have somehow made this perspective irrelevant. And it's difficult to find a pure Malay. Essentially, many have mistakenly assumed Malay to be solely an ethnic category. It is not. Besides being an ethnic category, being Malay could also be seen as a cultural category. It seems that the government is taking a cultural perspective to this reserve elections for Malays. But an ethnic definition in other instances, for example, Yayasan Mendaki applies ethnic perspective when administering the tertiary tuition fee subsidy, TTFS financial assistance scheme. Now, in the past, there have been complaints that Mendaki have turned on requests by those who are not seen as pure Malays. Some Indian Muslims, for instance, were referred to Sinda instead. It was only in 2011 that Mendaki extended the eligibility criteria to include double-barreled race, with Malay as the first component, such as Malay Indian, or Malay Chinese. This comparison with TTFS has emerged online because the three presidential candidates are regarded as Malays despite having mixed Indian parentage. The cultural versus ethnic definition of Malays remains confusing for some people. Let me move on to the second perspective. The second perspective is the role of Islam, language, and Malay culture as important identity markers. Some question the possibility of someone becoming Malay or masuk Melayu by embracing Islam. Again, these criticisms fail to understand the cultural perspective of being Malay. In Singapore, there are many sub-ethnic groups subsumed under the Malay category. The Javanese, the Boyanese, Bugis, Malaccans, Sundanese, Minangs, and more. What binds them together is religion, language, and Malay culture. Some Indian Muslims and Pakistanis associate themselves with Malays. They speak the language, they practice Malay culture, and the Malays accept them as such. This is at least Mr. Farid Khan's argument. Generally, these communities do not see a problem with this association, at least in Singapore's context. Those who do not want to be seen as Malays are free to disassociate themselves from the community. Personally, I reckon that the three candidates identify themselves as part of the community and the Malays accept them. The fact that all of them are Muslims strengthen their case. However, the extent in which candidates practice Malay culture or speak Malay became the center of attention. Mr. Saleh, for instance, was criticized for his inability to speak Malay fluently. 
The third perspective looks at candidates' presence in the community. I think this is a very important uh, point. The community is wary of opportunists who identify themselves with Malayness when it's advantageous to do so. Netizens question the candidates' empathy for the community. How deeply involved were they in community affairs in the past? Have they helped the community? Madam Halima has the advantage here, being visible in the public eye because she has been in politics, and Mr. Saleh Marikan for his businesses in Second Chance and Golden Chance. There was even a joke about these businesses, right? Second Chance and Golden Chance. Now, Mr. Farid Khan is relatively a newcomer in the public eye, though he has strong networks in the business circles. However, being in public office may be a boon or a bane. If you notice, Madam Halima spent a bit of time explaining that her associations with the PAP does not affect her independence, saying that she still has the community's interests at heart. Mr. Saleh and Mr. Farid can claim that they were never part of the establishment. How do we define Singapore Malays then? In my personal view, there is generally a stable core which majority Singapore Malays identify with, which is similar to the Malaysian constitutions and how they recognize the community. Malays are Muslims, majority of them are Muslims, speak the Malay language and follow the Malay custom. Singapore's definition of a Malay is more inclusive than that. A Malay is any person, whether the Malay race or otherwise, who considers himself to be a member of the Malay community and who is generally accepted as a member of the Malay community by that community. Now, this definition applies for Malay candidates intending to run as MPs for a GRC. The question now is, how does one measure acceptance by the community? The government has devised an elite-driven mechanism by setting up a commission made up of prominent elites in the community to determine whether one is a Malay or otherwise. But at the societal level, Malays generally look at several qualities. Candidates' ability to speak Malay, their religious outlook, and contributions to the Malay community. However, like all Singaporeans, the Malays are not only discussing issues surrounding candidates' identity. They evaluate the qualities of these presidential hopefuls. Even Madam Halima's decision to delay announcing her candidacy is met with skepticism. Is she decisive enough to be president? This is what netizens claim. Netizens also ask if this election is necessary, since Singapore calls itself meritocratic. Some young Malays I know said that they'd rather have a president elected based on his or her own merit. Some Malays believe that the reserve elections is a step back to the progress of the community. True enough, before the government announced these amendments in the constitution, I have not heard of any Malay or any Muslim organizations asking for a Malay president. The decision is entirely the government's. On the other hand, some older Malays I spoke to welcomed this decision. Some even asked, what took the government so long? They reminisced the Yusuf Ishak presidency, who is a pride for Singapore Malays. The other names being Mr. Zubir Said, the composer of Majula Singapura, and Professor Ahmad Ibrahim, our first Attorney General. What surprises me, however, is that there's very little focus on candidates' gender. Here I'm referring to Madam Halima. I hardly hear any protest by Malays against a woman leading a country. A few years ago, there was a debate in Brita Haryan whether a woman can be appointed as a chairperson in a mosque, with many claiming that women cannot hold any leadership positions because Islam said so. The issue of gender was not raised this time, and some Malays I spoke to were excited because if elected, Singapore will have the first female president who is a Malay Muslim who dons the headscarf. Let me conclude by sharing some of my personal views. Is this reserve elections a step back for Singapore's nation building? 
Balancing meritocracy with multiculturalism remains a challenge for us. Colonial rule has cemented the CMIO model, and our nation building has not departed from it. Also, not all communities start on equal footing. Thus, our meritocracy has always been an abridged one. While race is still important, I see some positive developments. For instance, the government is slowly loosening up the GRC scheme. In the last elections, we see more minority candidates leading GRCs to victories. And in the latest by-elections, Mr. Morali Pillay, an Indian, won Bukit Bato SMC against a Chinese candidate, Dr. Chiu Sun Yuan. I think we should give this reserve presidential elections a chance, allow the Malay president to carry out the required duties well and touch the lives of Singaporeans with the aim of removing this highest triggered mechanism once multiculturalism stabilized. Remember, when Mr. S. R. Naden became president, through a walkover, many were skeptical and started comparing him with the vocal Mr. Ong Ting Chong. But Mr. Naden did an extraordinary job and became the people's president. It is important for this Malay president to emulate Mr. Naden. I sincerely hope this Malay president, whoever he or she is, will contest the following elections when it's open for all. It is in that election, not this one, which will test our multiculturalism. Lastly, the Malay president must speak for all Singaporeans. In today's context, there is a convergence of interests among all ethnic communities and issues can no longer be defined unique to any particular community. The Malay presidential candidate must articulate Singaporeans' interests because Singaporeans expect their president to rise up to the occasion and unite all citizens in times of crisis, even though their role is not a political one. Candidates' record of voicing his community's concern is an indicator whether he or she will speak for Singaporeans in times of crisis. Let us not judge this president on the grounds of his or her ethnicity, but on what he or she can offer for the country. For the candidates, history will not judge you on whether you win this presidential election, but how you touch the lives of ordinary Singaporeans. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. It's time we can have Mr. Gosin Tick to share with us his thoughts. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, although I'm from uh, the Chinese newspaper, I have to declare and uh, clarify that I am not here to reflect the Chinese ground, simply because there isn't one. The Chinese community is a highly divisive community on many national issues, especially this one. <laughs> I mean, you have the Chinese-speaking Chinese community, you have the non-Chinese-speaking Chinese community, you have the old generation, you have the younger generation, you have the liberals and the conservatives. And they don't actually follow that, okay, the younger one are the liberals, or the, uh, or the Chinese-speaking with the conservative. They don't follow that way. So it is really a diversified one. So I am not going to try to make to, to come here and, and, and reflect what is the Chinese ground. But more as a media person, my observation and uh, my takes on, on, on the issue raised in the traditional uh, media and also the social media during the run-up of this presidential election. And of course, one key issue that cannot be missed and is, is race, and understandably so. Uh, because what is so unique about this election, this reserve election, it is because it is based on race. This election is reserved for a Malay candidate. So race is the key issue this time around. And we see it from the traditional media, whether it's, it also, uh, you can see it also from the social media. But I, I just want to touch on one aspect of the race in which um, my... Uh, my fellow panelists also touched on that also. 
which is how do we define race? And I find that the discussion is quite interesting because as a society, as a whole, I think we use the word race in a very loose sense. Although just now, when uh, the minister answered a question from the participants, he actually gave it a very legalistic definition of race. But as a society, we look at race, we, when we talk about race, we use it in a very loose sense. But when these presidential elections come, we actually have an internal discussion and we found that each person's understanding of race is quite different. And so we can take a closer look at the three potential candidates. And people ask, and that, are they really Malays? Are they Malay enough? One of them, because according to his IC, that's what uh, I have been made to understand, according to the IC, he's a Pakistani. So is he a Malay? Mr. Saleh was... Uh, how should I not criticize? Not criticized, but was brought up that uh, he, his Malay, his command of Malay is not that fluent. Huh? And then, of course, uh, Madam Halima, uh, her father is an Indian. So people ask that questions. And so, how do we then define Malay? Of course, uh, religion play a part, language play a part, ancestry root play a part. But I think to different races, all these attributes have different priority and different weightage. And from this discussion, we can see that Malay, as a race, I think they are more inclusive. Then I ask myself, how then do you define Chinese? And then I find that it is not such an easy Question, uh, is it answer? Huh? I, I, don't, I don't have an answer, in fact. Definitely, religion does not play an important role. Whether you are Catholic, you are Christian, you are Taoist, even for that matter, if you are Muslim, you can still consider as Chinese. So, religion doesn't matter. And although I am from a Chinese press, the fact that you cannot speak a word of Chinese does not make you a non-Chinese. If you are... <laughs> you get what I mean, right? So again, language is not an important or necessary criteria. So if you have someone who looks like a Chinese, has a Chinese name, has a Chinese and just street root, or, or simply put, has Chinese blood, and he cannot speak a word of Chinese, he is still considered as a Chinese. Then what constitutes a Chinese then? then I think we have to only look at it from his blood, right? Then, again, it's not so simple. If a person, father is an, he's, he's an Indian, mother is a Chinese, and he has an Indian name, and he speaks Chinese, and he practices Chinese language, and uh, practice Chinese culture, is he considered a Chinese or an Indian? I do not have an answer. Worse still, worse still. If his grandfather is an Indian or a Malay, the grandmother is a Chinese, the father and mother, the father of course then becomes half Chinese. Huh? The mother again is a Chinese. So he, he is four quarter Chinese and one quarter Indian. And then he has an Indian name. And then he practices Chinese culture. Maybe not speak, uh, okay then is he considered a Chinese? Again, I don't have an answer. Then you say, okay, never mind. We need to answer this question only 30 years later. <laughs> because the last president, uh, the last EP was uh, uh, Dr. Tony Tan, so 30 years later. But I'm not too sure whether we can only answer that question only 30 years later. Because let's say if the next presidential election the one that I described to you actually won the election. That three-quarter Chinese. Huh? But he has an Indian name. And then on his IC, maybe he's written there, Indian, 
maybe by that time he can also write Chinese, I do not know. Then we have to ask ourselves, that 30 years, should we not count his term or should we count his term? Right? Things get complicated when we try to understand how do we define a race. So this is something that actually when I look at the, the discussion on the internet and, and also on the uh, traditional media, this is something that strikes me. Okay, by the way, and don't think of Chinese only as Han Zhu. In fact, actually you can be not a Han, but still a Chinese. Then you get even more complicated. I, know, I, I won't go into that anymore. <laughs> okay, another issue. Should we have an election just for the sake of having one? I think this is hotly debated now. And then people are expecting or half hoping that uh, the presidential election committee will grant three COE so that we can have an election. I'm not too sure whether because we want to have a public holiday <laughs> or because we want to exercise our voting right. Huh? But I think it is the latter. Huh? But should we have one just for the sake of having one. So some people argue that never mind. If the other two does not qualify, we can lower the standard. Because the committee has the discretion to grant all three. That's my personal view. And I'm not trying to preempt what the committee has said, is going to say. This is just my take on this. If some criteria were to set quite clearly, my opinion is that we should not lower the criteria. But if it is a grey area, then it is up to that committee to deliberate and use their discretion. So if the criteria said it very clearly, a number there, and you do not meet that number, my personal opinion is that then you should not qualify. But if it is a grey area, for example, if you are a president or the vice chancellor of a university, does it qualify you or does it not qualify you? It is not clear right now in the, in, in the constitution, right? So then you go on to the spirit. Okay, a president or a vice chancellor of a university, how much does he actually control? How much money does he actually control? And then, of course, there are universities and there are universities. Huh? You have the dubious university with 500, uh, 500 students and then you have the really reputa uh, with reputations. Huh? But can he or he, she, as a president of a university, be qualified? Then I think it is up to the committee to decide. Use their discretion because it is not clear. But if you have a number and you cannot meet that number, I think that committee should not use their discretion to say, okay, never mind, we just lower the bar and then for the sake of having an election. That's my take. Another issue coming up is that, I should put it, no contest rather than no election. No contest equals no mandate. Someone brought it up just now also. I mean, personally, I, I, I would also like to see a contest because I want to use, I want to exercise my voting right. But to carry this argument to that far that if there's no contest, there's no election, I personally do not buy it. I mean, we, we talk about President Naden. Huh? He returned or he won the election twice, unopposed. Huh? At that time, nobody actually come out and say that uh, you have no mandate. There are some whispers, but majority of us accepted it and this is not only for president election. Not very long ago, well, if you think 10 plus years, not very long ago. Huh? In the general elections, on the nomination day, not very long ago, that, that is 2001, 16 years ago. Not really that far if you are 50 years old like me. On the nomination day, in fact, the government already become, take office and become the government because less than half of the seats are not contested. 
That time, we never say, those, not con- those seats that are not contested, they are not the real MP because they are not contested. Have you ever asked that question? We actually praised, at that time, the opposition's strategy because opposition say, let's take every general election as a by-election so that you can vote free of fear, that you can have no fear that there is a change of government. And people think that that is a good strategy at that time. Do we actually ask ourselves our questions that, hey, half of the parliament MPs are not actually voted by the people and so they are not the real MP. Have we actually questioned that? Why are we questioning it now? Again, I have declared that I would like to have a contest. But I do not personally think that we should have a contest just for, for the sake of it. For that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Goh. Now we can have Dr. Kevin Tan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, let me thank IPS for inviting me here to share some of my views about this forthcoming reserved election. Um, originally, I think Gillian wanted me to talk about a number of things, but I think today what I will try to do, given the paucity of time, and I'm, I apologize, I don't have any slides to share with you because I kept changing my mind as to what I was going to say. Um, I will restrict myself to doing what constitutional lawyers are supposed to do, uh, which is to point out problems uh, and, um, and, 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 and to highlight what the issues are, so, you know, rather than uh, create problems. Um, three main points which I want to talk about. The first one, which has been alluded to by a number of people already, by my fellow panellists already, about the difficulty of determining who is or is not a Malay. This is, in fact, a legal question. It is fundamentally a sociological question, which, um, of course, Minister Shamugam mentioned earlier. But the point here is that it is a legal question. It is a legal question because it is there in the Constitution. So once you put it into law, the moment you put it there and you have a legal definition of what is or uh, who is or is not a Malay, then you need to be able to uh, qualify and to quantify this. Now, this is a major problem. As has been pointed out by a number of people already, uh, who exactly constitutes a Malay? Now, the, the, question in the, con- the, the definition in the Constitution, I think, has already been mentioned several times, but I wish to point out one particular um, anomaly. If you look at the Constitution, they talk about Chinese community, they talk about uh, who is a Chinese, who is a Malay, and who is an Indian. Now, in both the cases of Indian, uh, Indian and other community, and well, as well as Chinese and uh, uh, Chinese community, all that the candidate needs to do is to define himself or herself as a Chinese. So two parts. I define myself as Chinese, and I'm accepted by the Chinese as a Chinese. Same thing with Indians, right? Uh, someone belonging to the Indian or either my, uh, other minority community who considers himself to be a member of an Indian community or other community and is accepted as such right, by that community. Seems fairly simple. Big problem number one is tautologous. If I don't know who a Chinese is, where is my Chinese community? If I cannot define the individual as is or is not a Chinese, then where am I going to locate the Chinese community? And the same applies right down the line. With Malay candidates, it gets even uh, more interesting because, uh, and I think in, back in 1988, this formula when it was first um, brought up, uh, they already recognized that it is almost next to impossible to define who is or is not a Malay. I think uh, for those of you who are interested, you only need to read uh, this wonderful book by uh, Professor Leonard Andaya called Leaves of the Same Tree to see how difficult it is because it is a social construct. We make it up. You know, this thing about race, about who is or is not uh, a Malay or is Chinese and so on is actually socially constructed. So this is the problem here. But in the case of the Malay, that it actually says a person belonging to... The Malay community means any person, and here, nobody else has this phrase, whether of the Malay race or otherwise. So, this means that I can, I, I, me, Kevin Tan, can go and say I'm Malay. 
even though I'm not of Malay uh, stock, right? Um, theoretically, theoretically. Now here, here's just a legal argument. I'm not uh, uh, making sociological arguments, right? Um, so this is where you've got one problem. So what is the legal problem here? The legal problem here is violation of Article 12.1, potentially. Article 12.1 of the Constitution provides that all persons are equal before the law and are entitled to the equal protection of the law. Now, that does not mean that all persons are treated exactly alike. Discrimination is not per se illegal. We discriminate for a whole host of reasons. So, for example, we dis discriminate between children and adults, for example. That, that's not illegal, that's not wrong. All that the tests that have been developed by our courts requires is that two parts of a test known as the reasonable classification test is satisfied. So what are these two parts? The first part is that you must have something called an intelligible differentia. What is an intelligible differentia? It is, it is an intelligible way of deciding who is a member of a class and who is not. So this is one of the criteria. So I first must know who is the class that's being discriminated against, right? or positively discriminated in favour of. So for example, who is or is not a child is very clear. There is an intelligible difference here because uh, under our legislation, a child is a person below the age of 16. So it's a binary question. You are over 16 or not above 16. It's very easy, right? Uh, I, can, I, can, I can clearly decide who the class is. The problem here is that who is or is not a Malay does not quite fit into this test. In other words, it potentially violates the intelligible differential aspect of the test. Now, just to finish up, the second part of the test says that I must then have a rational nexus between the object of the discrimination and the class that is being discriminated against. So let me use a, a more uh, everyday example. We, we don't want young people to go and watch certain types of movies. So that's why we have classification and some of them require to, you to be uh, at least 21 years old. So it's easy, we can see what the object is to protect young persons against well, undesirable influences from watching certain types of movies, for example. Who are these young persons? Well, there is a, a way of classification. That classification is based on age. So you're either above 21 or you're below 21. Straightforward. The problem here is this. We want to ensure some kind of minority representation. And in this particular case, representation of Malays in the presidential office. So if you want to do that, then you must be able to say, all right, who is or is not a Malay first? And then link it to the object of the discrimination. So potentially, there's a constitutional issue there, right? If somebody raises a challenge to say that this election is potentially unconstitutional, right? Because uh, it, it violates Article 12 because we don't really know who a Malay is or we do not know with certainty and arbitrariness uh, is unconstitutional. First big problem. The second uh, related problem to this is the question of who decides who is or is not a Malay. I know there are committees, there is the community community. By the way, it's not just five persons, it's 16 persons in the community. Five from each of the categories, so five from the Chinese community, five from the Malay community, and five from the Indian and others community, uh, plus uh, Eddie Teo, chairman of the PSC, who is the head of that community. So that the decision is not made by the five in the Malay community alone. It's made by all 16, by the way. Right? So um, it says in the constitution also, and the minister said this just now, I think somebody asked whether there is a recourse to legal challenge. It says that the decision shall be final and not subject to any review or appeal by the court. Uh, I would venture to say that that's probably unconstitutional. <laughs> you can have all kinds of things saying that the court cannot review. But the basic fundamental principle about the separation of powers is this. 
that if the court has to interpret the constitution, no branch of the government can tell the court what to do or what not to do because the job of the court is to interpret the constitution. If the, if the court chooses to make the constitution, then of course it's violating, exceeding the powers that's given to the court. Right? So right here, I think another possible problem. Second problem which was raised um, by a number of us at the uh, Constitutional Commission last year, which is the problem of the parity between the public sector candidates and the private sector candidates. Um, in trying to find some person, the ideal person to be an elected president whose main job is to safeguard the reserves and to ensure integrity of the civil service, you have two aspects going. One is maturity and experience. The second is competence. Maturity and experience comes with age. So we set the barrier at 45 years of age. No problem because you eventually get there. Uh, presumably racking up experience along the way. But the competence aspect is where it is inherently problematic. Because under the constitution, again, uh, you have automatic qualifications for certain offices in, uh, which are establishment-type figures who are invariably you know, part of the executive mechanism or the judicial mechanism or part of the state mechanism. So the Constitutional Commission recognised that there was a disparity. They, in fact, recommended that um, if you are in the public service uh, if you were a public service candidate, the requirement should not be just three years in that office, but at least six years. This was rejected by Parliament. Parliament chose to retain the, the old provision in the Constitution. So now, if you are a minister, a chief justice, a uh, speaker, attorney general, chairman of the PSC, auditor general, accountant general, or permanent secretary, you would automatically... Uh, 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 qualify subject to the other criteria that you're a person of good character and so on and so forth, right? Um, now, how in the world does this um, act as a proxy with um, somebody who runs a multi-million dollar company, right? Was it really necessary to push the criteria up? Now, I'm not making this argument only because there seems to be a disparity that's going on here, but it structurally reduces the number of minority candidates that qualify. So somebody asked the question, why do so few people come qualify? First of all, it's a numbers game. So the more difficult you make the criteria, the less likely you are going to get a minority member in it. It's, it's a simple numbers game. Right? Uh, the more, more people you have, the more likely you are to win the gold medal, right? So you, you're a big country, you've got more talent around, sure, you're more likely to get gold medals, right? So if Singapore did so well in the SEA Games, that's really quite exceptional, right? So it's a numbers game. How then uh, do you square with this? There is a major uh, disparity and I think uh, the Parliament missed an opportunity to redress this or maybe it was intentional not to redress this because the public sector candidate, uh, 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 automatic qualification provides what may eventually people might consider a backdoor into the presidency. The final argument is with the legitimacy thing. And, and, and again, uh, my fellow uh, panelists have talked about it, and minister talked about it. Oh, no need to have another election. No point having an election. I think there are flawed arguments there. You should have an election because the whole purpose of transforming what used to be a nominated office, where you didn't even have to worry about telling people what race you chose, you just picked somebody you thought was good. The whole purpose of this is so that that person has the mandate to actually stop an elected government. That's quite different from putting yourself forward in an election because you are not actually running for a political office. You are there to safeguard the reserves. So yes, granted, if you keep making the criteria more and more difficult with less and less candidates coming forward, you're going to have more and more cases where you are going to have only sole candidates. I made the suggestion long ago and I said, I, I think someone said no one, uh, I think Sintek said no, no one challenged it. It's not true. I challenged this a long time ago uh, when they first uh, changed the provisions. And I said, no, even if there is just one candidate, I think that candidate ought to go for some kind of an endorsement or an affirmation exercise. 
you know, and I, I, I said something like, oh, you know, you just need to get maybe 20%, at least 20% one US president, right? Uh, you, you know, if you can't get even 20%, then you really should not be there. Uh, uh, I think President Nathan wasn't very happy with this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, actually, he kept telling people every time he sees me, he said, "Ah, this man, you no, know, said I wasn't properly elected. I wasn't properly elected." <laughs> Until one day, I, I I got a bit fed up, <laughs> uh, and I say, "Sir, sir, I ne never said that you were not properly elected. I only said you were not elected, right?" <laughs> um, so there is a problem here that needs to be addressed. And I will. I, I've got half a minute left, and I will wrap up with this. I think people got all caught up with all this, and everyone forgot one basic thing: the timing of the election. This is a constitutional problem. Article 17b, which was amended by the Constitution, requires the election of a sitting president who would run a natural course of term, like President Tony Tan, to have the election held not more than three months before the end of the term. Tony Tan's term has ended. We still haven't had an election. Any election that's held after that is prima facie on the face of it, unconstitutional. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. We had some good discussions here and I'm sure you have enjoyed what we've heard just now, but very important points that we can uh, think about. Yeah, I think you can. Yeah. We're going to open the floor for questions. I know there are a couple of hands. I want to take a couple of questions. We've had the speakers very dutifully end on time, and so we've got some time. So I'd like to ask you to make sure that you keep your comments very succinct, brief, and they get to the point with that question. All right, so we've, I've got a couple of, if you can just go to the mic, I think I've got four people who have got hands up, and uh, one, uh, two right there. Yes. Uh, we, sir, would you want to go up to the mic and uh, start the question? Uh, sorry, I think there is a... Or don't I just go ahead and make a question? Uh, can you hear me? Is it on? Is it on now? Yeah, okay, I'm Aruna from RSIS. Uh, I have this question for Noel Char Charlil Saad. Uh, I am a student of uh, uh, Malay culture and uh, I studied uh, the understanding of how one becomes Malay. There's something called Masuk Melayu. Uh, and this is a sensitive issue because Unlike the Johor princess who married a European man, and that's how you can masuk Melayu and through conversion Islam, the traditional sources of uh, races who were marrying into Malay communities were the Siamese, Indians, and the Chinese. But this created uh, a hierarchy of uh, preferences and racist uh, issues. For example, if you were of Indian descent, you were known as Dara Keturunan Keling. DKK and the other person who really fought this was Mahathir because he had a Carolan descent and throughout his entire reign uh, he promoted Malay identity nationalism in a very big way so considering that most of our uh, you know members up for election uh, those with Indian blood are they going to also have these similar issues within the Malay community in terms of respect are they continually going to have to assert their Malayness versus being Dara Keturunan Keling? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Take a question. Kevin, what a rubber rouser. Um, I think Singaporeans should learn to be slower to judge, not so quick to fire. I think what we discussed today is very interesting, very good. We should not stop here. The verdict will only be much later, by historians. Yeah? So race is uh, one of those very organic things, I think. And Singapore is a construct which is quite artificial. And I'm glad the government is daring to be different again, to do something which is quite unique. Yeah? So like uh, Go said, right? race is quite, to me, quite organic and it's fluid. Um, it, it's difficult to pin it down, but I think the government has defined race by two, largely two general factors. You, you choose and you practice as one of the community member, and the community member accepts you. Very large, not so precise as constitutionally uh, uh, specific, yeah? but 
is largely community driven rather than constitution driven. Uh, so I think we should not take too far into the end of the conversation, you know. Really, it's the community that should decide, not constitutional law or the government, right? So as I think it, 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 we should not say it's good, bad, or it's correct or incorrect. Let time take its pleasure to eventually decide for us later on. Thank you. Thank you. you just go ahead and have Nosharel first. Then. Is the mic Tess. All right, Tiger. Thanks, Aruna, for the very interesting question. I think the phenomenon of Masop Melayu is more uh, relevant to the Malaysian context, though we see uh, similar cases uh, in Singapore. Uh, particularly one interesting case would be um, in the past when Chinese babies were given to Malay families. I think on their identity cards, they were referred to as Malays. Right? So, so I think this is a classic case of Masop Melayu. And, and your, your question is very interesting. Um, are the candidates going to have to assert themselves um, based on the discussions online, a lot of questions have been posed regarding um, their ethnicity, uh, whether they are Malay enough, and I think the candidates understand uh, the importance of this and they have tried their best to address um, these uh, questions, right? So I think uh, Saleh Marikan, for instance, have came out strongly because the first time he came out, uh, one of the major criticisms was that he was unable to speak a good Malay, so he said that you know he came back strongly and said that you know I'm able to speak uh, a broken Malay, you know Malay that's more identified with the masses. So I think this issue is going to be played up again and again, and I think this issue will continue. But but I think the candidates also realize that ethnicity alone uh, is not uh, uh, the only issue. I think they are trying to to tell. Um, uh, Singaporeans uh, about their contributions in the past. For instance, they're they are always coming up saying that they have spoken up for the community, how much they have donated to the community. And I think essentially what's important is how uh, uh, they are able uh, to contribute to Singaporeans at large. And I think this is what Singaporeans is, 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 is waiting to see because who votes them into power is not the Malay community. And it's also all Singaporeans. Thank you. On well, the question of should constitutional law decide the whole issue of no, I think, I think the trouble is um, I, I raise these issues because it's in the constitution. I, I wish it wasn't. I wish they didn't have to do this. I wish, uh, in fact, at the select committee, I, uh, the, the constitutional commission, I did suggest that actually we should simply abandon this election uh, uh, of, of presidents. We go back to nomination because you're making it almost a nominated office. I, I wish, uh, you know, we didn't have to deal with this. But the moment you make it a legal provision, then I have to point out to you what the legal problems are. And, 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 and this is not a good thing because it will polarize. Thank you. I think we have two questions there. Hi, I'm Suliana, and I'm from the Ministry of Education. Uh, this question is for Dr. Nosharel. So um, I think it builds on what uh, the earlier questions are. So in this case, what, what do you think that uh, with the issue of race uh, now undergirding the reserve uh, elections this year, um, how do you perceive uh, the construct of the Malay identity to change, maybe even after the uh, elections, yeah? And especially to Malay Singaporeans, uh, Indian, Chinese Singaporeans, and others. So that's my first question. My second question that, and also uh, given, again, the racial criteria being, uh, being the main or central concern in the elections, um, do you think that this can potentially uh, either open up or even price um, race, um, race relations further instead, uh, and then therefore going against the multicultural aspect by actually going the other way? So uh, that would be my second question. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman there, would you like, were you asking a question? Sorry. The gentleman standing up there, were you, uh, yeah. please go ahead. Okay, I've got a question for uh, Kevin. My name is Lee Chu San. Uh, the only thing uh, I have in common with Kevin is that we, we went to the same school. Uh, Kevin, since you pointed out that uh, this, there's quite a number of legal irregularities with this uh, particular election, I'd like your opinion as a legal expert. Uh, uh, what can be done to rectify these uh, irregularities? Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions that we're taking? No. All right, you just go ahead. No, sure. I'll start with. Thanks, uh, Selena, for the question. Uh, will this construct of Malayadity change? I think it's been fairly consistent. Uh, as what I've indicated earlier, 
at least the way Malaysia understand it, I think it's similar to very much um, in terms of the identity markers, uh, the candidates try to portray themselves and, and I think the way they portray themselves fits uh, the, the conditions that has been set in Malaysian constitution as well as, as in Singapore, um, particularly uh, Islam. So you can see that you know, uh, the candidates are actively going on the ground, uh, showing that they are good Muslims. Uh, Malay language, and you know that, that's that's uh, that's the area in which they are trying to, to convince the Malay ground that they are they are proficient in the Malay language and also uh, Malay culture, right? Of course, Mr. Farid Khan, for instance, says that you know he's raised as a Malay, you know he he grew up as a Malay. So I think based on the uh, the way they are campaigning, I would say um, I think the 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 identity markers, the identity construct is fairly consistent and it hasn't changed. Whether this will help foster uh, a better understanding. I think this uh, reserve election has created uh, a lot of interest about what constitutes Malayness. I think this is very healthy. I think in the past we, we accept this as a given. I think, uh, I think this is a good exercise you know, uh, for Malays to themselves speak up and, 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 and tell Singaporeans that this is how the Malay community is identified. So I think, I think in a way it has created generated interest about, about the Malay community and I think in, in one way uh, this has helped foster better understanding. Mr. Goh, do you think that race relations will be improved with this new me mechanism? I, I, I can see an intrinsic tension or intrinsic dilemma here. First of all, you have to, a candidate has to convince first huh, to his own race or his own people, his or her people, that he belongs to that race. But if you're overdoing it, then you make the other races become a bit more uh, concerned. Huh? Because the president, we, we don't forget, huh? just now minister reminded us, that president should be a unifying figure. So if you are too Malay or too Chinese or too Indian, then the non-Chinese, non-Indian or non-Malay would then think that are you unifying everybody? Are you representing everybody? That's why Madam Halima, because of the fact that she's wearing Tudong, actually there were some concerns uh, from the non-Malay ground. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mm, Kevin. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Susan, for the questions. Um, what can be done? Well, you can amend the constitution, of course. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, that, that, that is the only thing that can legally and logically be done. Okay, what if you don't? Well, first of all, there is a strong presumption of constitutionality uh, that's adopted by our courts, meaning that uh, laws are presumed to be constitutional until and unless otherwise challenged by somebody. So, un unless somebody is prepared to come forward you know, put some money down and say, I'm going to challenge this decision, uh, then it's just going to be there and you will just keep carrying on. But there is a danger because you don't want somebody three years from now going to court and saying X was unconstitutionally elected in the 2016 election because government was out of time. Can you imagine the constitutional uh, crisis you're going to, you know? then you're going to start asking, oh goodness, did this president make any decision on any appointment of senior uh, government officials or make any decision relating to the drawdown of reserves in the last three years? If that were the case, then you have to draw back. Then what do you do? You ask, ask president pay back. You can't do that, no? But it's a real problem. I, I, I mean, I'm only making it sound funny. It's not that funny. <laughs> if you were there... Would you like to be potentially knocked out on that basis? I think that's a problem. As with the question of race, like I said, that, that one, unless somebody goes up there and challenges again, it will just carry on, okay, until somebody does. But you, you have to live with the possibility that when that happens, uh, you, you might lose things, all right? You, 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 you might lose uh, all the things, all the structures and institutions that you set up for. Thank you. I think we've got a few other questions. If you're coming to the mic, gentleman there. Hello, uh, my name is Vernon Chan from Libertine Strategic Enterprises. My question is this: Are we being a little too naive here? Because when we designate a presidential election for a certain race, don't we actually encourage? 
candidates to play up their racial identities. You speak of it as if it's a theoretical problem, as if it might be one off with how the current candidates are, um, are proceeding with their campaigns, but are we a little naive into th in thinking that this is a one-off? We could actually, this will happen. Like um, if there is, for example, a reserved election for Chinese candidates, similar issues will creep up. People, instead of saying Masuk Melayu, people will say Masuk China because the Han identity has always been about um, cooking and incorporating what were previously barbarian races. So I'm not sure whether this is a good thing at all. Thanks. Thank you. It's a good question. I mean, will the reserve election lead to a hardening of racial lines? I think each one of our <laughs> panelists could probably give away you know, ideas here. Yeah. So let's go. I, I, I have made my, the, that point already, so nothing more to add. I mean, I must say that this is a government's decision. So um, I think true. I think uh, you can see that based on what is happening so far, I think um, there's a greater emphasis that the candidates are playing up their racial identity, um, trying to be more Malay. But the question is, is it easy to masuk Melayu? Um, I tell you it's not easy. It's not easy to convince the ground that you're, you can easily uh, become a Malay unless you are really from that community. And I think, and I think um, you know, yes, people say that you can embrace Islam and, and become a Malay, but people will judge you on other, other issues. But ultimately, at the end of the day, as I emphasize uh, in my speech, uh, yes, this ele elections um, is about a race-based elections, but at the end of the day, the presidential candidate has to win the hearts and minds of all Singaporeans. So I think, as what uh, my fellow panelists has said, uh, if you emphasize too much of your racial identity, that could be counterproductive and you may not get the support from the other communities. So, so yes, you can emphasize your race identity, but at the end, lose uh, a segment of the... This is a dilemma for the presidential candidates, I say. So the idea about chauvinism is checked by the community itself. It's yes, the idea of chauvinism is definitely checked by the community itself because, the moment you, because it's a multiracial society, the moment you emphasize on a particular identity, you will lose out certain segments of the community. Thank you. Kevin, do you have a thought? Um, no, I think it's a bad idea. But um, since that's the, the, as much as I want to say, maybe I can ask a question of North Sharil about Maso Melayu, right? I mean, what if you got somebody who is Malay, without doubt ethnically Malay, right? But is Christian with a Chinese wife? Boleh Maso Melayu or already inside Melayu? Um... Personally, on a personal note, I think uh, we will welcome that. I mean, if, if let's say there's a Christian Malay, I mean, there are many Christian Malays in Malaysia. Uh, I don't think they're accepted as Malays because of the... Uh, That's because of Article 3. Exactly. Yeah. But I think if this issue crops up in, in, the, in Singapore, personally, I would welcome it, but I'm not sure if the community is ready uh, uh, to accept uh, a Christian Malay. Because I think if you look at the sentiments on the ground today, I think you understand the political uh, 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 sentiments on the ground, particularly in the communities, that you must be a Muslim. So, a person who has got an Indian father and a Malay mother is more Malay than a wholehearted Malay, but who happens to be a Christian. Correct? Yes, I think technically, yes. Yeah. You see the problem? <laughs> Eugene, you go ahead and ask that question. Yeah, um, no, I, I mean, Kevin beat me to it. Um, so, so the question is uh, the same, right? So w when we look at the, the, the definition, right, the definition doesn't of who is a Malay or an Indian or Chinese, but particularly in, for the Malay community, the question here is, right, will the, com will the community regard religion, you know, as a requirement for someone to be Malay? And, and that poses a lot of problem, right, simply because it infringes the person's right to religious freedom, right, Article 15. Um, you know, so that opens another uh, potential can of worms, right, because if a Malay Christian, a Christian Malay, right, is not given a 
certificate of eligibility, yeah. uh, I think that, ca that person can take his case to the courts. Thank you. Any thoughts on the panel? No, I agree. I agree with Eugene. <laughs> I think it's quite clear that there might be issues which we might have to think about in years to come, but at least at this point of time, I think the notion about the community and how the community is viewing uh, notions of race seems to be a little bit more, I mean, there is some, some kind of structure. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, and we from NUS. I wonder if we're getting a bit carried away with what is in fact a bizarre Malay phrase, Maso Malayu. I mean, there must be a high Malay language way of saying someone has become a Muslim. Uh, and I'm wondering whether in fact the Maso Malayu isn't really just bizarre Malay. I can't think of any uh, at this point of time, but uh, I think, like what I mentioned, I think uh, to become culturally a Malay would be, would be a better way to phrase it. But this, of course, has been uh, used by academics to say that you become a Malay. But I think uh, you, have, you can become culturally a Malay, not solely on ethnic grounds, but culturally you practice uh, Malay culture. I mean, I mean you, uh, the way Malay celebrate Hari Raya, for instance, the, the, the Idul Fitri, I mean, they come to Ramos wearing the Malay costumes. So I think culturally, uh, you can become culturally Malay. Yeah. Is there a phrase for that? No, there's no phrase for that. Any final questions? If, if I may then ask uh, doc, Dr. Tan, and under the constitution, can, can one identify oneself to two races? <laughs> so long as you're accepted by the communities of those two races, yeah. of course. <laughs> Assuming you, you, they know who they are, right? Yeah. I mean, let's take Joseph Schooling. Yeah. Right? Um, the father is Eurasian, the mother is Chinese. Uh, of course, Eurasian Association claims him, you see his face plastered everywhere. So if he wants to claim himself as a Eurasian, I think later on, under the others, that would be fine. But if he said, I'm also a Chinese, I don't know what the, the sentiments would be. So yes, you, you can claim, yeah. but then how is that 16-member committee going to make a decision? Yeah. They don't, I mean, how do you, find, first of all, you want to know who your community is. And that's why I keep saying it's tautologous. It's no use saying that, you know, uh, you're using the same phrase to define the same class. You, you, you don't know who the Malay is, then you, how do you know who the Malay community is? That's a big problem. Well, we're running out of time. Uh, my quick thoughts about this is that I think we're still in a stage where we still understand race. I mean, we do understand the notions of flexibility, the notions of how race is constructed. I think there is still some notion about a community we're having some sense of this. We're very fortunate we don't have the kind of constitutional kind of challenges that we, we, we might have, as Dr. Kevin is saying, it might come in time. But if you look at the broader purpose of the election, the whole notion about somehow that we need a safeguard a minority representation, I think we need to put that at the broader uh, point as we think about some of these issues about how do we deal with different kinds of notions of identity. With that, I want to thank all our panelists for helping out. Uh, Wilson Tick, Michelle Rill, and Kevin, thank you very much.